All right, uh, friends, this morning I was scheduled to speak on mercy. I was um, going to pick up where Pastor Dave Buring left off in our series, Encountering God. Um, uh, and I, I am going to. I am going to talk about mercy today. Um, and I want to say that we're going to end on a really good news kind of note. We're just going to have to get through some stuff to get there, okay? Um, if you haven't realized by now, I'm, I, I just can't seem to be the guy who leaves hot topic cultural issues alone. <laughs> and I, I would that every pulpit in the United States of America took the opportunity today to speak God's truth and love about a very difficult situation that um, is, is hot in the press right now. So today, this morning, I wanna talk to you about the issue of abortion, but I need to say a few things up front. These are not the words of uh, an angry, uptight, right-wing, conservative maniac. They're not. They are the words of a concerned, compassionate follower of Jesus who wants to, more than anything, communicate the truth of God in a spirit of love and compassion. So I've got no stones to throw at anybody. I'm not here to condemn anybody or make anybody feel bad. I realize that one in three women have had an abortion. Just on this campus alone today, that represents hundreds of women. Not every man has participated in that. Sometimes the men don't know uh, when an abortion takes place. But there are men who suffer. They encouraged it, they paid for it, and then after the fact, um, they deal with shame and guilt and um, hurt and loss. I had a dear woman come up to me after first service and she said, Steve, I appreciated what you had to say, but um, I want to suggest something to you with all humility. And I thought, oh gosh, what did I do? <laughs> and she said, I've had four abortions. And she said, you need to let the people know that two people die when an abortion happens, the baby and part of the mom. I, I wanna set the stage by saying that abortion is a tragic thing. It is, it is difficult, it is heartbreaking. The consequences of it are far reaching. But before we get into this at all, I want you to hear me say that there is mercy from the throne room and more importantly from the heart of God himself for people, men and women, who have participated in this event. There is mercy, there is hope, there is healing, there is restoration for you. Understand that. We're not here to, to make anybody feel bad. We're gonna discuss some things, we're going to look at the spiritual history of abortion. Because as much as people might think that this is a, a political issue, cultural, racial issue, it, it, it goes into those arenas, friends, but I, I wanna tell you something. This is a spiritual issue. The issue of abortion, as I'm gonna clearly paint out for you today, it is a spiritual issue and it goes back thousands of years. Abortion didn't start with Roe v. Wade in 1973 goes way, way back, and it is spiritual in nature. I believe it's gonna be overcome by the people of God and knowing how to respond in the spirit and not in the flesh, lovingly, compassionately, not angrily and judgmentally, speaking the truth but speaking it in love. So we're gonna, 
venture into some things today, and I just wanted to try to, to set the tone just a little bit. There is mercy for the hurting without question. All right, well, I'd like to just pray one more time as we walk out onto thin ice and ask for the help of God who is loving and kind. Father, we position our hearts before you now with all humility, Lord, and all gratitude that you are good and that you are kind and that you are merciful. Lord, thank you that you invite us into your presence to be healed of all manner of sins. Particularly today, the sin of abortion. God, would you speak to us and solidify this issue in our hearts that we might be able to help those that we come in contact with. Holy Spirit, guide us and lead us into all truth and birth new levels of compassion in us. God, help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I, I want to start with this issue. Um, and, and again, as we will see as we unpack this, words are really important. Individual words are really important. And so when the abortion thing kind of really started um, becoming um, not just popular but then legal, we, we use words to, to try to desensitize us to the truth and the reality. And so we, we quit calling babies babies and we started calling them fetuses because somehow a fetus is obscure for us non-Latin speakers. Fetus is, is the Latin word for offspring. So it actually means baby, but if we'll just repeat fetus, 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 fetus over and over again, somehow it can desensitize us. So I, I want to say that what's in the womb is, is not just a fetus, it is a baby. It is a baby. It is a human being. It is a baby. Now, uh, to bring some biblical clarity to this, Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, the psalmist says, oh, we'll skip Carl Bart for this service. Psalm 139 says, for you, speaking of God, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. The psalmist says clearly that God marvelously formed and covered, made and created every single life that's in the womb. God himself is the architect of our personal being. We get to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, and this isn't the psalmist speaking. This is God himself speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah records, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, now here's what God said, beloved. Before I formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. What does this say? Again, that God formed, God knew, God sanctified and ordained and called even before conception. Children, babies have destinies before they take their first breath or get the first swat on their bottom. They have a destiny given to them by the God who knew them before they were even conceived. We go into the New Testament. The angel is speaking to Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, the cousin of Mary who was pregnant with Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 15, then verse 41, and then verse 44. 
speaking of John the Baptist, it says that he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be, look at this, filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Verse 41, and it happened when Elizabeth heard that Mary, the mother of Jesus, came and greeted her, that the babe in Elizabeth, who was John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. The babe, not the fetus. The babe, the child, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 44, for indeed, she says to Mary, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Do you see what the scripture says of babies? Not its, not blobs, not a mass of cells, but a he, a baby. And this baby leaps, and this baby's filled with the Holy Spirit, and this baby knows joy. This baby was only six months old at that time. John the Baptist was six months in his mother's womb. I love the reality of this. Think about this. The first person to recognize Jesus while he was in his mother's womb was another baby who was in his mother's womb. The first person to recognize Jesus while Jesus was in Mary's womb was another baby who we would know as John the Baptist who was in his own mother's womb. These are babies, these are people with destinies and callings on their life from God himself. The ancient church father, Tertullian, all the way back in 210 AD, made it very clear what the church's position was on life. He writes, now we allow that life begins with conception because we contend that the soul also begins from conception. Life taking its commencement at the same moment and place that the soul does. The teaching of the church for 2,000 years has been life. Personality begins at the very moment of conception itself. Now, beloved, this issue of of abortion, I am convinced that it is a spiritual issue and I am convinced that there is spiritual confusion that is contributing to the problem. Now, when we look at confusion in the scripture, there are three different reasons that contribute to a person or a people, a nation. There's three reasons why people get confused. The first one is rebellion against God. The scripture teaches us that when a person or a people decide that they are going to rebel against the ways of God, when they rebel, it opens the door for confusion of heart and mind to come in. The second contributor is the idolatry of sin. Once we rebel against God, then we begin to worship things other than God. Idols, not just statues, but opinions and thoughts and desires. All of it's idolatry. Rebellion, idolatry, and then thirdly, devotion to self. When rebellion, idolatry, and devotion to self comes in, confusion that is from the darkness of hell itself infiltrates people's hearts and minds and gets them thinking non-God thoughts about everything. There is confusion. There is chaos because of rebellion, idolatry, and self-devotion. I saw this huge billboard, a picture of it in Dallas, Texas. It was up last August, August of 2018, and uh, on the billboard, it had these words that just simply said, abortion is self-care. Abortion is self-care. 
What is self-care? Self-devotion, devotion to self. It's about you. It's about me, myself, and I. So it's got people on, on the billboard looking all happy and smiling. And then what we're telling people, again, because words are important, is abortion is self-care. Not abortion is murder, God forbid. But abortion is self-care. It's really just taking care of yourself. And taking care of ourselves is important, right? So if taking care of ourselves is important, then, and, and abortion is self-care, that means this is okay. And here's the smiley people on the billboard. This contributes to the confusion that has our nation walking blindly today. Now, I want to get into the ancient spiritual history of this issue of abortion. Again, this is nothing recent. This is as old as creation itself, almost. The ancient spiritual history. We go back into the book of Genesis, and many of us are familiar with Abraham, Father Abraham. Abraham had a nephew by the name of Lot. Lot lived in a town that we are familiar with called Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot lived there. Lot had two daughters, and they lived in this atmosphere, this community, if you will, that was plagued by rebellion against God, idolatry, and self-devotion. No wonder there was so much confusion in Sodom and Gomorrah. We see all three of those things at work there. Well, Lot's two daughters come to the conclusion that they need to get their father drunk, they need to get Lot drunk, and they need to have sex with him so that he can impregnate them, okay? So we pick this story up in Genesis chapter 19, verse 36 and 38. Now look at this. It says, thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. That's called incest. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. The Moabites and the Ammonites were the byproduct of sexual perversion that manifested itself in incest. That's, that, that is the foundation of these two nations. Now, the Ammonites, and this is an ancient uh, picture. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but I want to introduce you to the Ammonite god of Molech. You can see Molech there. He's a, a human figure with a bull's head and outstretched arms. He's ready to receive the children who were destined for sacrifice. The image was metal. It was heated red hot by a fire inside the hollowed out bowels of this image. Parents then placed their babies, their infants as you can see, into the hands or the arms of Molech until the children then burned and fell into a fire that was there at Molech's feet. There were drummers, trumpeteers, and flute players there to drown out the sound of the screaming, tortured children. And the mothers stood before Molech in an attitude of voluntary worship tearless, and apparently unmoved by what was going on. Molech, remember that name from the Ammonites, one of their gods. Now the Moabites, they worshiped another god who archaeologists believe is actually just another form of Molech. His name was Chemosh Malek. You can sense the similarity there. They believe he's the exact same God and the exact same um, uh, practices happened there. So the important thing to notice, beloved, is that these nations that were birthed from sexual perversion then gave birth to child sacrifice, 
rebellion, idolatry, and self-devotion created the moral confusion that led to infanticide or the death of infants. This is a spiritual practice that goes back thousands of years. Now as the children of Israel come into the promised land and into Canaan's land where all of this is going on, God speaks a very strong word of of, uh, warning to them and forbids the practice of the spiritual worship of Molech. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Now, let me say clearly, this is not permission for us to kill abortion doctors or bomb abortion buildings. God forbid we become like them then. My point in bringing this up, though, is under the theocracy of the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, God said this issue of child sacrifice is so important that if the people of God give themselves over to abortion, they need to be stoned until they're dead. This is a serious issue with God, as you can tell. Well, Israel disobeyed hundreds of years later. We know that they're introduced not just to Molech, but to Baal as well. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 35, look at this ongoing issue of child sacrifice and abortion. It says, and they built the high places of Baal, which were the high places of worship, pagan worship, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech. Which, God says, I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Hundreds of years have passed. The pagans continue to sacrifice and abort children. God gives them warning. Israel doesn't heed it. They give place to the sacrifice. They give place to abortion. Until finally in the days of Jeremiah, God is warning them and says, among other things, this is one of the very reasons why I'm bringing judgment on the nation and sending you into exile. Now, listen, friends. Are we good with saying God knows everything? He's, he's all-knowing, right? He is, he is all-knowing. I love how God uses human language here to get our attention about the seriousness of this matter. God says, it didn't even come into my mind that you all would do this. It didn't even come into my mind. Like, I know you humans can come up with some crazy stuff, but it never even came into my mind that you would murder your own children and, and commit this abomination. Notice he doesn't just call it sin. He calls it the very worst kind of sin, which is an abomination. It, it literally means a repugnant stench, a repelling stench in the nostrils of God. He goes, I didn't even think y'all could come up with this. But they did, and it's continued throughout the ages, bowing, worshiping at the altar of Molech. The examples go on just in regular history. There is a Phoenician goddess by the name of Tanit, T-A-N-I-T, Tanit. Archaeologists have found massive, massive graves in ancient Carthage, which is current Tunisia, northern Africa. They have found massive graves, bones of children, even very brand new firstborn infants, as well as children into their younger uh, um, ages. Carthage, ancient Carthage that worshiped Tanit, this fertility goddess, was culturally advanced. They were highly educated, and yet they gave themselves over to massive amounts of child sacrifice until they were judged, and the Romans came and destroyed their nation. 
serious ancient issue. It is spiritual worship in nature, and we don't even realize it. Now, you might find yourself this morning saying, Steve, this is all kind of about children, though. This doesn't sound like abortion, as bad as infanticide is. This doesn't sound like abortion. Well, Amos chapter 1, verse 13, the prophet speaks on behalf of God, and he says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, meaning I'm bringing judgment against you because of your sins. And what does he say? Because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead that they might enlarge their territory. This is abortion in the Bible. In the midst of the people of God, the people of God participating in it, the Gentiles promoting it and participating in it. But God says this ancient practice happened not just, just in fanticide, but abortion itself by ripping open the womb. It's, God says that they did it to enlarge their territory. I think it's interesting that it, this isn't just about enlarging their, their land territory and so they're attacking women who are with child, depleting future generations of their enemies. But beloved, this is beyond that. This is extending the boundaries of acceptable human behavior. This is enlarging their territory between what they feel is right and wrong. This is them going to places that God says, I never even imagined that you all would go there. Extending the boundaries of acceptable human behavior. Friends, we have been doing that in the United States of America. We have extended the boundaries of acceptable human behavior. When the governor of New York gets up surrounded by representatives and celebrates late-term abortion and is so happy about it that he lights up the towers in New York City. When the governor of Virginia doesn't just talk about infanticide, but when questioned about it, doubles down on it. Governor Northam doubled down on it. Said, I stand by my words. That when a child is born that either survived an abortion or we deem to be an unviable infant. Listen to the words again. The words are important. We will keep the child comfortable. Oh, so you're not that bad. That you want to keep a baby comfortable while you talk about how you're going to kill it while it's outside of the womb. Does this bother anybody? Does that bother anybody? He's the governor of Virginia. No relenting from it. Double down on it. Yeah, it's tough. Proverbs twenty two twenty eight warns us, don't remove the ancient boundary that your fathers have set. Our fathers, the prophets, have set the boundary. We have gotten rid of the boundary and we have extended the boundaries of acceptable human behavior. Now as we go into Jewish history, this issue of abortion and infanticide, this atrocity, is summarized for us. In Psalm 106, verse 33, the psalmist writes and says, talking, walking you through Israeli history, Jewish history, because they rebelled, there's rebellion. Because they rebelled against God's spirit that he spoke rashly with his lips, they did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and actually learned their works. Now look at number two. They served their idols. There's rebellion, there's idolatry, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters, look at beloved, to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. 
Thus they were defiled by what? Their own works. And they played the harlot by their own deeds. Selfish devotion. Rebellion, idolatry, selfish devotion are right there in the middle of the sacrificing of their own children. Now, this issue of sacrifice, it's properly defined, the giving up of something of value to get something better from a deity. The giving up of something of value in order to get something better from a deity. That's what sacrifice is. Beloved, abortion in America is not consciously done with any desire to get a blessing from a deity, but it is done to gain something better than the baby. And we need to be sure that we see it in these terms. The life of a child is being sacrificed for something. And what that something is defines the current barbarity of our culture. The something better than a baby is our rights. The something better than the baby is our convenience. The something better than the baby is our reproductive health. I want to say all of this as tenderly but as as clearly as I know how. We have merely changed the names of the demon gods that we worship. We no longer bow the knee at Moloch as we sacrifice our children. Now we bow our knee in sacrifice to rights to convenience and to what we call reproductive health even though abortion is not healthy for what's been reproduced. Molech and Chemosh and Tanit we unknowingly worship and bow in sacrifice The scripture says that we sacrifice our sons and our daughters, not fetuses, not even children, but the most personal term is used, our sons and our daughters, God said, you sacrificed. Family members. Innocent blood has been shed. The babies, innocent lives were taken, innocent They didn't do anything to deserve being dismembered limb by limb. And God says, you have shed the innocent blood of your sons and daughters. And when you did it, you did it to demons. God says this is spiritual. It is worshiping at the altar of demonic gods that we now called rights, convenience, and reproductive health. History teaches us that satanic worship is behind abortion. Jesus teaches us that Satan has been a murderer from the very beginning. Now abortion has become very secular, rational, and high-minded. It is demonic nonetheless. Love what John Piper said about this issue. He said, and someday we will see this. We're gonna wake up. We will be as amazed that it could have endured so long as we are that the enslavement of Africans lasted as long as it did. The issue is just as clear as that one was and we are just as blind today as they were then. Now I told you that this would get heavy. We'd have to make our way through some stuff but we would get to some good news, and so now let's, please, let's get to some good news. I do believe that we're blind, but I believe that that blindness is lifting, and I believe that blindness is lifting all around the world. Last February 1st, the National Review, uh, a, a huge long article, I just wanted to print some snippets for you to see. February 1st, 2018, 
Speaking of a 20, uh, January 2017 uh, Quinnipiac poll, which found that 18 to 34 year olds were more likely than other age demographics to support a ban on abortions after 20 weeks gestation. 45 years after the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, the cultural battle over abortion is not over. Some of the pressure to end legal abortion will come from millennial voters. Can somebody say, God bless the millennials? Recent polling has shown that young adults are more likely than other age demographics to support the Department of Justice investigation of Planned Parenthood. Our youth are saying, quit killing the youth. Our youth are the ones saying, investigate Planned Parenthood. We're selling baby parts, for goodness sake. I'm glad our youth is stepping up to the plate. I quoted you from the conservative National Review. Let me quote to you from liberal Vox. December 3rd, 2018, just two months ago, reported that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that the national abortion rate declined, look at this, 26% between 2006 and 2015, hitting the lowest level that the government has on record. The proportion of abortions to live births is also down to historic lows. In 2005, the abortion ratio was about 233 abortions for every 1,000 live births. We are aborting 25% of our children. But in 2015, it was 188 abortions for 1,000 live births. It is also part of an international trend too. Separate research has found that looking even further back in history, abortion rates in developed countries across Europe and North America are all declining. In the early 1990s, there were 45 abortions for every 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 44. That figure has now dropped to 27 abortions per 1,000 women. That's almost a 50% drop. Friends, I am absolutely convinced that abortion is being aborted. I am absolutely convinced of it. I hope I'm not too far out in front of the rest of you. I'm telling what I feel in my spirit and said two years ago publicly for the first time, I believe we are going to see the reversal of Roe v. Wade in the United States of America. We're going to see it come to an end because people are waking up. They're seeing what's up. They're realizing that these are children and change is coming. Now, let me also say to you that abortion advocates, they sense what's going on. The spirit that compels them understands the warfare that this is. Abortion advocates, you can expect them to be more outspoken, to be more angry, and to try to pass more heinous bills than they ever had before. I don't look at that and get panicked. I look at that and go, the enemy knows his time is short. This is his last ditch effort because this thing's about to be done and they are panicking right now. I'm telling you, pro-abortion advocates in Washington, D.C. and around the world are horrified right now to think that one of our Supreme Court justices could soon be replaced by a pro-life Supreme Court justice. They are terrified about it right now. So they're doing everything that they can. (laughs) You watch and see the next Supreme Court justice. Wait and see. Even if it's a woman... Even if it's a woman, you think what they did to Judge Kavanaugh was something, you wait and see what's going to come to the next person because they know what it means. They know that if the Supreme Court turns six to three conservative, even if we have one person like Justice Kennedy did in 1992, even if one of them flips, two of them won't. 
We're going to see Roe v. Wade change. Mark my words. So what do we do? What do we do in the meantime? We need to pray. We need to pray and confess the sin of abortion on behalf of our entire nation. It doesn't matter whether you've had one or not. I have asked God and confessed to God many, many times for the sin of our nation, for the sin of the church, for the sin of the people. God, I confess on their behalf. We have sinned against you in this. God, we ask for forgiveness and mercy. Pray, beloved. Pray, pray, pray. And then stand. Stand. Stand for the unborn. Stand for truth. Stand. Stand for politicians. This isn't political. What I'm saying is when you find a pro-life politician who wants to further the pro-life agenda, stand with him. Don't just call him or email him when you're mad at him. Support him when he's pro-life. Support her when she's pro-life. Stand with godly politicians. Call. Do this call. Who's your, who's your representative? Call him. Call him and say, hey, you're, you're pro-life. You want to see him vote or her vote pro-life. Call somebody. Be nice. Be kind. But call. And finally, support, support. Support the unborn. Support the, the, the pregnant. Support ministries like, like a, a Hope Clinic for Women. Support. Listen. There's so many different ways this message can go. I'm, I'm about done, I promise you. But friends, listen, I, I don't want to be known as the guy or the church that is, that is anti-abortion. I want to be known as being pro-life. I, I want to be known to the little girl who makes a mistake with her 16-year-old boyfriend that I'm not so against what she did that her only thing to know to do is to have an abortion. And then she adds sin upon sin and heartbreak upon heartbreak. I want to stand for the pregnant. I want to tell the little girl and the little boy that made the mistake, come here and let us take care of you. Let us help you. Let us show you mercy and compassion. We're, we're, we're so nervous that we're going to appeal, uh, appear like we're condoning it. Listen, I would rather appear like I'm condoning it and save the life of a baby than have them think that I'm going to be so disgusted in their sexual sin that they then add abortion to their list of crimes. Support, love, kindness, mercy, gentleness, Gentleness to the, to the pregnant, gentleness to the person who's had the abortion, gentleness to the, to the boyfriend or the man who funded it, gentleness and mercy. It doesn't mean that we're saying what they did was okay. God forbid we've, it, we've established it's not okay. But there's got to be hope for all of us beyond our own, our own sin, our own iniquity. There's got to be hope for us. We looked at Psalm 106 when we looked at the consolidated history of, of Israel. God had a hard word to speak to them about sacrificing their children to demons. But the psalm doesn't stop there. It gets picked up a few verses later. Psalm 106, verse 44 and 45. Whew. Nevertheless. Can somebody say nevertheless? <laughs> nevertheless. God regarded their affliction. And when he heard their cry, a real cry, a cry that doesn't try to justify sin and abortion, a cry that says, I'm done calling it okay, and I'm willing to name it what it is. It is rebellion, it is idolatry, it is self-devotion. God, I'm sorry. He said, nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. And for their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitude of his mercy. There is mercy through the person of Jesus. There's nobody that can heal you 
like Jesus can. Guilt, shame, regret, remorse, everything that that the devil, the enemy of your soul would love to keep you bound in after you took the bait that he dangled in front of you. See, he doesn't just tempt. He tempts and then we fall, he condemns. He's a ruthless enemy. Your only hope for freedom and forgiveness and hope and healing is Jesus Christ. And he offers it and he welcomes you. Come and get it. He died so you could be free. Don't let the enemy keep that away from you. Come on. Come and get forgiveness. He's waiting. Well, beloved, we have endured together these last 40 moments. It's not easy to say, but I will not be silent. And it's not easy to hear. It takes courage. It takes courage for you to sit and listen. It takes courage for you to pray. It takes courage for you to stand. It takes courage for you to speak and to call. It takes courage for you to support. Beloved, in a day where courage is lacking, let's be the courageous people of God. Let's stand for love. Let's stand for life. And let's stand for mercy for all. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So go in the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you shine for him. May God give you wisdom and sensitivity in every conversation you have. May you speak the wisdom and heart of God. May you bring hope and healing to people that desperately need it. In Jesus' name. Go make a difference. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, family.